Hi, I'm Masaba Gupta. Each week on How I Masaba from Luminary, I talk to one incredible woman about how they do well them. These are the inspirational mindsets, necessary daily practices, and only funny in hindsight experiences that have defined and continue to drive our culture's greatest. In my world, the world of fashion, for more than a hundred years, there's been one name that has defined what fashion is, what it stands for, and how it impacts our culture. I am, of course, talking about Vogue, the holy bible of fashion. Today, I'm joined by someone who has revamped the face of Vogue India, given it a completely new shape, new character, and a new soul, all in less than a year. Under her vision and leadership, Vogue India has seen a tremendous growth in its circulation, taking it back to where it has always belonged, to the apex of fashion culture. Today, I'm joined by the head of editorial content of Vogue India, Megha Kapoor. I'm going to start with our first in-person meeting. I know we met on Zoom before, but the first time we met in person was at Olive. I remember I was very stressed out because I said, oh my God, I'm going to meet the new editor of Vogue India and I'm wearing this giant white shirt and am I like underdressed? And I remember walking in and I saw you in the exact same white shirt yep. and black pants. Yeah. Um, and I was like, okay, I think we're fine. So I just want to talk about one, I find that you're very, very relaxed given the position that you're in and hats off because I think it can be very stressful. But what what's really going on in that amazing creative brain of yours? Let's start with that. Well, I mean, firstly, I thought you looked very chic when you walked in. Um, I'm I'm definitely tend towards a simpler, more. Um, I have a uniform, so that's kind. Of, it's it takes a decision out of my day, which leaves more room to actually think about the stuff I have to think about. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, look. I feel like at one time there's so many things going on. Mm. This role is so multidimensional in that, you know, we're trying to obviously we've been trying to make so many changes creatively um, in terms of the type of the staff we have even, in terms of the way that we're disseminating information to the audience. I'm, I'm a little bit obsessive and not very balanced. So I think probably like the that sort of cool, calm exterior, chill exterior where maybe, you know, like I've I've rocked in and Birkenstocks and like my my usual blazer is just it's just a way of me honestly just trying to take a bit of control back and just saying, that's not something that I actually need to think about. I've got that down pat. I need to be comfortable and I just kind of need to leave as much room in my mind to just be thinking about um the real stuff the real stuff the real stuff and um you know and and I will say like a lot of it is creative but then I think as you would know like with every project you know you probably end up spending about 7% of 100% of time thinking creatively and the rest is just logistics production yeah you know admin um just trying to get the thing off the ground and navigating like all the sort of people that sort of plug in because as you know it's never it's never just one person it it takes a village yeah yeah i keep saying i'm a glorified admin person in my company seriously i mean you have to wear so i mean i can't imagine you wear so many hats so many hats, but um, I, I find that the hardest part, to be honest, is kind of switching roles and sort of like juggling all these, all these um, people, <laughs> all these goddamn people, all these voices in my head. You know? Yeah. And I feel like I have different personalities now because I'm just like, I remember when we were talking and I was like, how do I introduce myself? What do I really do? Because I do so many things. Yeah. 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 And yeah. I have those many voices in my head. Yeah. And it's such a strength, but I think. I mean, that's one of the things that I love about just this industry and, and evolving is, that, you know, like, how do you define yourself? Do you have to define yourself? I feel a bit the same. It's like, well, I don't know. I style, I write, I edit, I try and manage stuff. Not really that well. I try and have some sort of like professional boundaries. Again, probably not really that well, but I think we're all just kind of like trying to muddle our way through it and do as much as we can, right? Yeah, absolutely. And I think you're doing well, by the way. Thank Master. you. Thank you. Let's start with your move to Bombay. Mm -hmm. A lot of people move to Bombay, okay? And I feel like it's one of those places that just 
helps you dream bigger. Mm-hmm. You know, it's that kind of city. But I also think you've taken on a role where, you know, you do need to have, well, conventionally, you do need to have some sort of connections. You need to kind of be an insider. Mm-hmm. Um, you need to be like one phone call away from, well, um, Bollywood. But you're obviously on your way to doing that in the way that people are now just finding out who they are with you. They're building a relationship, etc. But how important do you think that is uh, in a role like yours? Well, I mean, it's that's a really interesting question. And I'm, I'm so glad that you asked that because I think sometimes that's been a little bit of the elephant in the room with me taking on this role. You know, I think a lot of people were like, who? Who? Who is this random person coming in <laughs> from Australia? We have no context for her. Um, yeah. And I was very cognizant of that coming in I think at the same time the fact that I am I am an outsider right is has kind of protected me in the sense that I um I just all the relationships that I forge have to be based on um based in something real you know I'm getting there for sure and of course on the professional side of course there are some you know, you have to deal with agents, you have to deal with, you know, like the industry at large and and PRs and and whatnot. But I think sort of building that network of people, both for myself and also for Vogue, I'm kind of approaching in in a similar way. It has to be based on genuine, a genuine connection. Yeah. Yeah. I did feel that with you. I felt like you're not just trying to make that connect because you have to. It's just that you feel it, you know, and maybe some will fall away and some will stay, but I think we'll figure that out. Yeah, you can't be, and you can't be everything to everyone, right? Yes. Um, I think that's that's one thing I've learned just getting older is that, you know, even though it's, of course, like even in something like Vogue, Vogue, while I'm really trying to open it up and make it more diverse and, and I want people to feel included, it isn't everything to everyone. And sometimes... We have to say no to certain things, yeah, um, and 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 have boundaries within Vogue as well. And those boundaries, I feel like, will be appreciated later. You know, I hope so. History will be <laughs> kind to you, Mega. <laughs> okay, um, a little bit more on Bollywood because it's a big part of our culture, right, in India and Indian fashion and Bollywood very closely connected. You know, Bollywood music is connected to everything as well. And what I want to ask you is, how do you see the relationship between these two evolving? Because I think you've also entered the industry at a time where things are changing. One, there's almost a new guard in Bollywood, right? Mm -hmm. There's the younger brigade that's coming in. Mm -hmm. They're very, very fashion conscious. They're aware. They're, you know, on trend, et cetera, et cetera. How do you plan to navigate this relationship between Bollywood and fashion? Yeah, and I, uh, it's a really interesting one. And like you said, they are so intertwined in India, um, you know, as the entertainment industry, well, the fashion industry, I guess, in a lot of ways, when I came in, was really an extension of the entertainment industry. Correct. Look, I think my personal approach and what I believe is that, you know, they are separate industries at the end of the day. And with something like Vogue, it has to have... It has to retain its voice just as a talent has to retain their voice. And I think the beauty of collaboration is when two parties come together and there's a mutual respect and a mutual understanding and a mutually agreed upon goal and creative and you create together. I think I want to hero young models. I want to hero young designers. I see an industry in this country that honestly is so much more than Bollywood. And while I see it as such an incredible, powerful, you know, part of Indian culture, um, I certainly don't see it as kind of wrapping up the whole fashion industry as a whole. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, that brings me to my next question. Whatever happened to the supermodel in India, right? Yeah. I was talking to someone the other day and I was thinking, I think it was Carol, Carol Gracious, who was probably... One of the last few supermodels that we Mm. saw, she's a mom now. I don't know if she's actively working, but I remember thinking there was a time when you had, you know, Sheetal Malar and you had uh, Lakshmi Lakshmi. Menon. You had incredible girls. A lot of them now, the younger girls, want to start off with the West. Yeah. Why do you think that is? Well, I think 
I think it goes back to what we were talking about before. I think it's I think it's been this conflation of the fact that fashion and, and the entertainment industry kind of became one. Mm. And, you know, we just had Ashley Radajame on our October, you know, Beautiful. Tamil Beauty. And, you know, she, what was crazy to me is that she is literally, if I go to shows in Paris or New York or wherever, she, that girl is on every single runway. You know, she is a headliner for Vuitton. Mm-hmm. But she she does not work in this country. So it was so important to bring her back to where she's from and put her in Indian clothes, modern Indian clothes. I think, you know, I see that as part of what Vogue's mission has to be is, I mean, honestly, there is so much talent here in terms of like the modeling talent. It is staggering. I think part of what we need to do is just re-educate people to see beauty in this way perhaps old fashioned beauty tropes being celebrated hmm. in the you know things colorism and just like types of the types of beauty that is sort of like put on a pedestal so you know i think whatever little part we can play and i can play it's about sort of putting those girls on a pedestal as well because yeah. i agree they are it is astounding the amount of talent and it shouldn't just be our, our best export like they should be able to have careers here but right now um you know, and I, gosh, I hope I'm not being too um, <laughs> too forthright. This is my problem. <laughs> but like, you know, I look at I look at fashion weeks here, right? Yeah. Who who are the headliners? It's a celebrity. It's a celebrity that's like anchoring these shows. So we have to we have to relook at what how we're casting, who we're celebrating, and you know, to that point, I think Sabia does an amazing job. He does, yeah. You know, like he really sort of. I look at those campaigns, and they feel so modern because it's diverse. It's 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 true editorial casting. Yeah, and I also think he does it in a very India proud way. Yeah. Which which is amazing. Totally. A little bit about, you know, your move to India again. Do you feel like the work culture here and back home is vastly different? What do you think is the best and the worst thing about working here? So it is different. It's definitely different. Um it's not better or worse. It's just a different way mm-hmm. of operating and one that, you know, has been a real transition for me. And I think I'm still very much in in the throes of that transition. I mean, honestly, like spending 50 minutes in a car each way, just kind of like, <laughs> like you know, I've become very sort of nimble in terms of just getting stuff done on my phone and then trying to like not, you know, kind of go green because I'm feeling car sick. Um, <laughs> it's... Before I came to, you know, to India and to Kananas, like I was working for myself, you know, so so I had my own company. I was working for myself, had my own magazine, freelancing. So, you know, I was really sort of like master of my own time. And like, yes, I had staff, but certainly not the amount that I'm managing now. And so just in that respect, like if I wanted to go and go for a, a swim at 3 p.m. because I just come off a big job, I would just go and do it. You know, like I was I was very much master of my own time and could kind of be quite selfish in terms of how I structured it. Here, it's very, you know, like I'm in the office. It's literally like in the office till about 9 p.m. come back. So I feel like my life is really just work, work. here. There's mm-hmm. not much else. Um, you know, I think I think just being in a, and because I am quite bullish in terms of having been an entrepreneur and kind of used to sort of running my own race, I find things a little slow. Yeah, a little bit slow. And like everyone kind of really needs to ask permission. And sometimes I'm like, just go do it, babe. Like if you want to do it, just go do it and tell me how how it happened. But I think there's this kind of sense of, I think it's people are just a bit more respectful or something. Oh, there's, really? Yeah, I don't know. It's like this kind of having to ask permission to do things and then kind of having to put things on email a million times. And it's kind of like this very like, I don't know, whereas I'm just kind of more used to um just being okay let's do it and let's just go you know it's funny you say that because I would think it was the other way around because I keep telling my girls I'm like listen don't send that email just (laughs) come talk to me and let's get this done you know but there might be a structured play you know where where you come from and I feel like sometimes it's just nicer that way because then everything's like kind of documented but I understand it can slow things down because you sometimes want to do things and there's a moment to do them. Totally. And then the moment passes and you can't do them again. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. I think I think it's that. Um, mm. And also, you know, we're, we're sort of pivoting and we're getting there and it's been like a massively successful year digitally. But I think pivoting a lot of the, um, 
you know, a lot of the staff to just think in that way. And digital is quick. Social media is, you have to be iterative. You have to be responsive. Um, you know, sometimes it might interfere with the way you had blocked out to plan your day. And we just kind of have to roll with that. So I think it's just shifting mindsets, but it's happening. And you spoke about digital. And I don't know if you're allowed to talk about the fact that Vogue India's print story has gotten bigger since you since you came on. Can we talk about that? Yeah, of course. Yeah? Of course. Okay. So tell me, <laughs> in a world which is just being, I call it like the democratization of fashion thanks to digital. Mm. But what's happening in the print space? Because everyone seems to say, oh, everything's going digital. But, you know, Vogue India print is blowing up. How's Thank that you. working out? Oh, you, you know, I think it's at the end of the day, it's about the content, right? So I think I think the stories that the team that we're all telling are, are resonating. I think also perhaps, you know, it's post-COVID. Mm-hmm. Like we, we are seeing, ma- I see the magazine everywhere. It's amazing. Like paste-ups everywhere, like, you know, um, scattered on, on coffee tables everywhere. So I think I think people are sort of craving that again and wanting to just you know, connect back with physical forms of things. Um, There is something so special about print at the end of the day. And I think I also really believe like, of course, you know, we're all consuming things constantly on our phones and whatnot, but there is, there is something ritualistic about sitting down with a magazine and literally giving yourself the time to just look through it and thumb through it. And I have seen a lot of um, I've seen a lot of people doing that, and I think it's almost become like a form of self care because yeah, don't you think? Like, because you're putting your phone away for a minute, you're actually like engrossing yourself with a with with a physical object, and um, you know, and I think a it's such a privilege that people are choosing to spend their time like that. But I think in terms of what we're trying to do with the print offering is we're trying to make it more collectible and less short form, more long form, um, you know, more generous sort of photo essays. So it just, so it feels a little bit more luxurious. Yeah, I felt that. And I feel like Vogue India is the only magazine I see scattered everywhere. You're right. I was at my Dermat yesterday and it was the only magazine everywhere. Oh, amazing. Now, there's a few legacy publications across the world that have always played a big part in setting trends, right? Um, There's Rolling Stone for music. There's Vogue in fashion and Wall Street Journal in business, right? There was a time when anything these kinds of publications put out was almost like it was the gospel. Do you see the role of these publications in society changing as the world is becoming a bit more connected? Where I feel like the world is getting smaller. There's a dialogue in, in a film I did. It said the world gets smaller as you get older. Yeah. And it's bang on. So true. But do you think people have access to so much information and... Uh, but do you think that these magazines, these publications are how how are they catching up to that? I you know, I think I think it's such a I think we have to ask ourselves that because I don't think gosh, maybe I shouldn't be saying this. I'm saying a lot that maybe I shouldn't be saying. But yeah, we'll I got it out the way. Um look, yeah, I don't know. Because mm. I I think that people are spoilt for choice. Um I think you can't assume that just because you have a masthead like a Vogue or a Wall Street or whatever that you are the authority on anything. I think at the end of the day, like the readers are really savvy and they have access to everything. So why should they come to you? Um, I think that's something we all have to ask ourselves as just creators in general. Um, so I, I mean, look, of course, it's such a powerful brand. And I have so much reverence and respect for the brand. Um, But at the end of the day, I think you can't just rest your laurels on being a brand. It it has to be, I I keep saying this and I feel like even at Forces, I I kept coming back to this. It's about the content. It's about the stories you're telling. It's about the, it's actually about the individual editors. Like so much more we're seeing, you know, people want opinions. You know, we did this piece, um, you know, when when Just Like That came out and that sex in the sari sort of yes. debacle and we did this piece and, you know, it was just such a beautifully written piece of um, commentary on what that meant and, you know, appropriation or not appropriation. And it was just, it was, you know, a brilliant piece of writing. And 
no one set out to make that go viral or and it was just it was the strength of the content that it went viral and it went everywhere. Right. So I think yeah, I think I think the relevance of a masthead doesn't because at the end of the day, you make a wrong turn, you can be that that masthead can be completely cancelled. You know, like it's 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 a it's not it's not such a given because there are options. And so I think I mean for me personally, it's just about respecting the content at the end of the day, understanding also what your masthead means, right? Like Vogue is Vogue is Vogue. Like you have to have a definition of what your vision for Vogue is going to be. Um, and I truly believe that. And I think maybe even now we're trying to do too much and be too much to too many people. Um, I've always believed that you you have a vision and you kind of stick to it and, and people will come and just stay true to that. So I think for us, we're going to try and like hone in on that for the next year. Um, but yeah, I think, you know, I think everyone should be on their toes. <laughs> it's yeah. not, you know, and I think that's a good thing. That's great because then I think, you know, people are also evolving. I feel like we don't give the audience credit for being exactly as smart as they are. Yeah. They are very smart. You know, we see that today with the kind of movies and content that they're consuming. And, and like you said, you have to keep evolving with the times. Yeah, yeah. totally. And, yeah. you know, I think the other, people are very focused on their values. Yes, yes. You know, like I think so much... I mean, I don't know, more than before, it's not about a, a flat image or if, you know, they they want to see themselves reflected and they want to see, you know, their values reflected. Like, you know, it, it, whether it's what they watch or what they read or what they buy, like that's one thing. And I think in India, for sure, like if, if their values don't align with something that you've put out on the internet, they will let you know about it <laughs> quite fiercely. <laughs> I think it's it's across the world, actually. I think what's happening in India, though, is that people want to read and consume things that are a reflection of what yeah. is going on in their life or what they're seeing around them. Yeah. And if we fail to keep up, fashion too, right? I yeah. mean, fashion has always been um, sort of you know, it's 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 like a little tail behind every big world event. Yeah. You know, we think we're inspired by something that's coming from another place, but it's actually everything that's happening around us. Colors. Totally. I mean, why do you think there's a hot pink trend? It's just because I think people want joy. Yeah. People want something that's vibrant and fun and nice to look at. Yeah. Yeah. About forces of fashion. So what's Anna really like? I think everyone wants to know. I must say my brief interaction with her was... I have to say, very warm. Yeah. And she's very sort of, um, it's almost like you're not as intimidated by her when you meet her in person. Yeah. It's almost like she's welcoming and warm. Yes. Um, what is it? What, what do you think is the main difference between what people perceive her to be as Anna Winter and what, what's she really like? What's that one thing? Look, I think um, she is, I will say she, I mean, it has been an absolute privilege to be sort of mentored and taught by her. She is, comp I mean, her level of professionalism, I think, especially as a woman, is can be very intimidating because mm. she is direct, she is decisive, she is so clear, um, and she doesn't compromise. So, you know, on her emails, it's lit like if you write her an email, she comes back to you within three minutes, no matter what time zone it is, and it will literally just be three lines sometimes or like three words in the mm -hmm. subject line and you're like, okay. Um, you know, and then when she's like, if we're looking through the book, it'll be like, no, Megha, I think you need to crop that like this. And, and, and I'll be like, yeah, you're so right. You know, she's she's just got this, um, and look, years and years of experience. So she yeah. has this kind of, this clarity and this kind of directness that I think we often assume is such a male trait. Yes. You know, and she's this, you know, very attractive, slight woman. So I think people are just like, wow. And then, of course, the glasses and she's just always so perfectly turned out. But like you said, she is so generous mm. and very warm. She actually has a really, like, I make her giggle, which I think is the thing I'm most proud of, <laughs> like to get a giggle out of Anna. But she does. She's kind of got this dry, she's very English. So she's got a dry sense of humor. Yeah. Um, and I think she's just very, she's so committed to um, her job and to just 
what this new vision for Vogue is. But beyond that, you can see that she she really cares for people. Yes. She really cares. For, and she's interested in meeting people. She was genuinely interested to meet yeah. yourself. Yeah. And, and I will also say she's more interested in meeting creatives. Like that is, I think that at the core has been the biggest sort of takeaway from me. She is a creative and that's, she recognizes that it's the creatives that make the magic. Yeah. And that's, that's really her her sweet spot is kind of wrapping her arms around the creative community and kind of being a champion for them. So, yeah, she's she's she, you know she's and I, and as I think we all want to be as as women who are you know in business or in in leadership positions and whatnot. Like you can be. I think she's just such an ama- fine example of the fact that you can be both. Th- both things yeah right yeah yeah you you can be fierce at work and you can be highly sort of um productive and clear but you can also have heart and soul and um be soft and be warm and um you know both things can be true whereas i think i think sometimes with her people like to just focus on that facade and like oh she's like that and they don't want to see and you know often i don't she doesn't let many people into that other side of her so which is fair i mean at that position i think it's it's fair. Yeah. You're protecting yourself, you know. Totally. And I think what I figured after meeting her was that um, you're right. It's that man woman thing. You know, um, she's very clear about what she wants. She's highly professional. And she's what, 70 plus. She might be 73. I think 74. she's 73. Yeah. yeah. And at that age, to have that kind of planning and be so meticulous. I mean, the stamina as well. I was yes. like, I mean, I fell in a heap. <laughs> after she as I was saying like I just kind of went okay I need to just like sit down for a minute yeah. um but you know she's on a she's on a plane straight back to you know straight back into meetings back mm. on email like she's she's a machine yeah. she's a machine and I think that that's why people are probably perceiving her to be who she is because you're like oh my god this woman knows exactly what she wants and what she wants out of the people that work with her totally yeah totally yeah, yeah. And okay. she doesn't drink alcohol. <gasps> yeah. So really? I think, I think I think that. Do you think that's the secret? Maybe, maybe. But you know, I look. I tried that for mm. a, a few weeks, and I was like, I'm definitely a better person when I can have a have a martini. Like it's just, <laughs> it's better for everyone. It's better. I, I will tell you, it's better for people around me for <laughs> sure. What's the most important thing you look for when you make a new hire? Ooh. Um, Oh, it's it's hard to put into words, but it's it's always, you know, it's always you always need to connect with them. I think the person, um, because I think if you work together, it's very hard to work with someone that you just don't kind of have a connection with, or can not even like a like a, on a friend level, but just that you can connect and communicate. Mm-hmm. Um, I look for talent. You know, I look for. I look for someone that is really passionate about something. Um, I mean, when it comes to sort of, obviously, you know, I get a lot of CVs and a lot of people reaching out, a lot of um, young people wanting to get into fashion. And I will say when it comes to sort of wanting to work in fashion, I often look for, I'm not really interested in people who just take pictures of themselves and, (laughs) you know, exist on social media and and think that is... I, I genuinely that's a resume yeah like mm. I, I genuinely um tend to go for you know someone that maybe has had experience outside I don't know someone that's worked in the theater or has worked as a journalist or has has I don't know done a degree in politics like mm. I think sometimes it's really nice when people bring a different perspective into fashion I mean that was me I you know okay I I did law and politics and loved fashion and then sort of found my way into this world of fashion. And I honestly believe having a grounding elsewhere has really helped helped me sort of, um, I don't know, be a better editor and be mm. more more fully rounded in my perspectives um, and I, th- I think appreciate it a bit more. So I don't know if that answers the question. I think it is it is a little bit innate, mm. but, but, but I will say it's never just, because you like to take pictures of yourselves in outfits. You know, it's funny, but for me, I have this 
and for the longest time my my business head would laugh at me because i said yeah very talented but the vibe is not right yeah. i said what's the vibe you know this like is the vibe the, is everything it's everything because yeah. you have this this great resume but if you for one don't have the ability to be nice to your team members mm-hmm. or delegate or sort of just become a bit more inclusive at work yeah what's the point totally you know so totally. i'm more of a gut feeling girl because yeah. when someone walks into the room and i'm like no i don't like the vibe yeah yeah and yeah. i think that's valid yeah i think i think we have to be able to i'm sure hr wouldn't like that i'm saying this <laughs> There's a lot of people not liking anything that's going on in this room. <laughs> But like it's a, it is a vibe check. You have to um you know and because we, I'm sure you is what you work so closely like my yeah. my team is like my everything. They're my family at the end of the day. Exactly. So you know we have to all get along and like a family sometimes we want to tear each other's hair out and you want to send someone to the naughty corner but <laughs> at the end of the day you still love them dearly. So yeah. I think you have to you have to sort of find someone that you know is you, you can bring into the fold like that. Yeah. And it's also a very intimate environment, you know, so too you, intimate sometimes. Yeah. yeah. And and you know you want to be with people that you feel good around and energy is everything. Yeah. It is. Totally. Okay, last few questions. You can make them as short or as elaborate as you like. Okay. What's the one trend you wish never got on? <gasps> too many? Oh, um <laughs> right now I'm going to get so I'm going to really show my age. It's mm. some of this Y2K dressing. Mm. I find some of it just I think because I lived it. I was 12, 13 and wearing butterfly glitter t-shirts and putting glitter on my face and wearing butterfly hair clips and I think you know trying to look like Gwen Stefani. So I just I see some of that coming back and I'm like I would rather not see that. So um yeah just really sort of showing my age as an elder millennial here but and it's not going anywhere <laughs> it it's is literally not. not going anywhere if so anything it's coming you. back then for yeah totally when was the last time you looked at something you'd worked on and didn't like it like like literally this morning i uh i have i i am a little bit unhealthy in terms of my um my mindset about like nothing's ever good enough basically mm. i have severe i have two things i have severe imposter syndrome and then i have this perfectionist sort of um you know narrative in my head so nothing i do i'm ever happy with and it's no reflection on anyone else that's been involved with it it's literally just my negative self talk mm. which is something i'm really trying to work on yes yes Who is your favorite collaborator or someone you really enjoy working with? Um, I mean, collaboration is a joy of this job. Uh, Nick Sethi is a f- amazing photographer. He's based in New York, but he came back to shoot the Ashley cover, mm-hmm. and that was amazing. Um, it was actually the first time that we were working together and often it can be such a scary thing because i think as you would know like you know creating images for your brand and just working creatively like so much is about having a established relationship and language and just kind of almost innately getting each other and i was a bit nervous when he came i was like what what's this going to be like but it just clicked and that was a really joyous really really joyous experience because we were just it was kind of like back being you know like just I don't know like 20 something like running around going a wall creating pictures mm. and that's what it was like with him around Pondicherry with Ashley and it was yeah it was it was a very special moment If you had the ability to green light any project in the world without worrying about finances obligations etc what would you be working on I have one that I've I think I can say it because I feel like I've put it out there on my on my Instagram enough. Mm-hmm. My dream project is Rekaji if you're listening. Please, <laughs> please I want to do an entire issue slash documentary on her, her style, her every like shoots inspired by her, her story. I just am so She's just kind of the OG for me. I've been so inspired by everything about her and I would just love to know more. You know, I feel like there's this kind of like 
mystical sort of like distance that she puts between her and the world. And I yes. just would love to get behind that veil. And um, I just feel like it has to be like a long form documentary that maybe culminates in an issue. So I'm putting it out there to the universe and I hope she's listening and I hope her management's listening because I'm not going to stop trying. <laughs> you know what the best part is? She doesn't have management. She's got one person who's been taking care of her work for years. Right. And I think that's, I don't know, I kind of feel like that's why the magic is still there. I mean, and the more and the more reclusive she is, the, mm. it's like it's like when you play hard to get with someone. It's yeah. like it's really working. Yeah, I feel like she's like an ex lover that didn't didn't give me time of day. Totally. And like I want to know everything about totally. you. I'm gonna stalk you. Yeah, I'm I'm obsessed. I'm obsessed, Raker. I'm obsessed. <laughs> okay. And the more you sort of push me away, the more I want to come closer. We will find a way to do this. <laughs> we must. Okay. Mika, thank you so much. Thank you. What I like to do at the end of every episode is just like, what have I learned from my guest? Okay. Okay. And I feel like with you, of course, I've learned so much. But I think the one thing is, how would I define you? Mika Kapoor trying to bring fashion back to fashion and isn't afraid to speak her mind. What a lovely way. I mean, what a compliment. Thank you. Yeah, it's true because I, I feel like it's it's hard to be like that. Um, doing what you do but you're doing both really well congratulations and welcome to India thank you what a privilege to be here in the next episode of How I Masaba I am speaking to the cricketing legend Mithali Raj tune in next week you were listening to How I Masaba only on Luminary the podcast is produced by Monisha Singhatyal and Rainshine Entertainment Hrithika Bajaj is our creative producer and Palash Kulkarni is our executive producer. The research for this episode was done by Anushka Mukherjee. The mix engineer for this episode is Ankit Thakur, artist management by Versus Entertainment LLP. The music supervisor for the episode is Ankur Srivastav. The episode was recorded at Island City Studios, Mumbai. <laughs>